Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Thursday. Brian Kamenetsky and Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers opened the season with a loss with a lineup that Lakers fans didn't necessarily want to see. How much center did Anthony Davis actually play on Tuesday night? Plus, Russell Westbrook's struggles put into more context and the Lakers play two of the more intriguing teams in the Western Conference this weekend. We'll talk about both coming up next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You know, not to get bogged down here, Andy, but that was a rock solid professional cold open for which I should be congratulated. Uh, I want to thank oh, everybody. Except for the fact you've had so much practice, I would argue, No. Eh, whatever. Uh, I want to thank everybody. We want to thank everybody for making Locked on Lakers your first listen of every day, Monday through Friday. The Locked on Lakers podcast here for you. We try to get this thing up as in the wee hours of the morning so you can uh, get it whenever you need it. I want to let you know as well that this episode of Locked on Lakers is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. 1965, um, also the year seven of the current Lakers were born. And the year that Andy graduated from high school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember graduating from high school and wondering, hmm, I wonder what this baby LeBron James is going to become. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. So there's a lot we want to talk about with Russell Westbrook. We got an interesting tweet uh, from a listener, Harish Red, um, that that I brought up. I, we, neither one of us agree with the point he's making, but the point is an interesting one. And it gets to a lot of, of the arc of, around Russell Westbrook that we're all going to be looking at over the course of the season. We want to get into some of the games the Lakers are going to play this weekend. But we want to start, Andy, with the start, the starting lineup that the Lakers put out in Tuesday's game, you know, as as everybody knows, most Lakers fans, I would say, would you agree, Andy? Uh, the the overwhelming majority want to see Anthony Davis play as much center as possible, ideally start at the five. Obviously, that didn't happen on <laughs> I was gonna Tuesday. say all of them except the ones named DeAndre Jordan. Right. Uh right. I mean, <laughs> and he gets a vote. He's a he Lakers fan. I mean, he, he He's a, a fan. Yeah, I'd like to think that he is a fan of this franchise. He voted for DeAndre Jordan um, <laughs> in a landslide he lost. In terms um, of the fan vote, he actually won, though, in terms of the actual execution. Right. And, uh, you know, the the other vote that matters here is Frank Vogel, who is probably inclined uh, more to, to lean to him. Look, G DeAndre played 13 minutes um, in Tuesday's loss to Golden State. Um, Dwight Howard only played 13 minutes in that game. And you saw from, from our friend Jovan Buha at the athletic does great work over there covering the Lakers, kind of a breakdown of when it was all said and done, how much time AD spent at the five. Yeah. According to Jovan, he played 22 of his 39 minutes at center, meaning, <clears throat> you know, some of the, it was 26 total center minutes that were played uh, by guys who weren't Anthony Davis, but some of those came when AD wasn't actually on the floor you know, Dwight Howard, for example, does not play with Anthony Davis at all. So that's ultimately how it all broke down. Right. And so, you know, it's it's one of those deals where like the, the ratios of the year they won the title, it was about 50, 50, 60, 40, uh, where where AD, especially down the stretch of games and into the playoffs, played center over um over uh, power forward, uh, play, yeah, played center over power forward. Last year was where the ratios really got out of whack, where he spent almost all of his time as a power as a as a uh, power forward instead of a center, and you know certainly had an impact, I think, on the Lakers' offense. And so, ideally, we've talked about this. The Lakers, uh, it, it it unlocks, I think, more possibilities in their roster. Certainly, I think, unlocks more possibilities with AD if he plays more five. He played a fair amount of it. And I think the, the, the tricky part here for figuring out what it's going to look like going forward is it was a weird opponent. Golden State's tough, tough team to play a lot of center against, um, given who they put out there. But also, too, the Lakers don't have their rotation intact, yeah. and they don't have enough wings right now necessarily to let Davis play five mostly exclusively like the rotation isn't helping either 
Yeah, I mean, we we talked about this a lot, Brian, leading up to this eventual decision, you know, in terms of at least the game one starting lineup. I have expected DeAndre Jordan in the starting lineup for a variety of reasons. And by the way, my expectation is not an endorsement. If this was just no, it's my an expectation. Read of the like right. retweet does not equal endorsement. Expectation does not equal endorsement. Exactly. I mean, F- Frank Vogel has seemed inclined to go this way, regardless of what AD's preferences are, which have been very well reported. And I'm sure still matter. But Vogel last season had worked very hard during the playoffs to maintain a more traditional lineup with you know with Andre Drummond in the center, even. When things weren't really working, you know, I mean, like it still was something that you could see that he looked to covet, even when acknowledging that his other option would have been Marc Gasol, who's not exactly a small ball option, you know, he's more, <laughs> right. but he's more floor stretching. But DeAndre, I mean, uh, well, DeAndre Jordan, but also Andre Drummond, this both leads to the same DeAndre thing. DeAndre like, Drummond. Well, you're talking about two guys who put a lot more pressure directly on the rim than Mark Gasol does. And, you know, they, they both leverage their size in really off. You mean, I, I think offensively. Yes. Is, I, and that is something, and that's, he was, Vogel was asked about that in the pregame um, Tuesday. What, you know, why, you know, what are you seeing from this? What do you like about it? And that was part of yeah. that. It was just, he, he likes the vertical threat. You can argue how vertical threat is well, but, DeAndre Jordan at right, this point, but, but that's what he's looking for. Right. O- offensively. This is, this is strictly, strictly an offense. Offen- yeah. Right. This is strictly an offensive thing. And you know, DeAndre Jordan, if, if nothing else in theory, and I think sometimes in principle does serve as a lane deterrent. You know, I don't think he's as good as Anthony Davis a, as your lane deterrent, but, but either way, this is something that I think Frank Vogel just covets from a philosophical standpoint and somewhere where he's going to lean, you know, against a lot of conventional wisdom in terms of his coaching peers around the league, people who cover the league, all that stuff. It's also, though, just going to be really difficult to gauge whether last night's lineup was the way Frank Vogel wants to go versus his hands being tied because of injuries, using the injuries as an excuse to tie his own hands. Because Friday, they play the Suns and DeAndre Ayton which is a matchup where you might look to go with DeAndre Jordan anyway. Well, like at least even some, if you were settling on a smaller lineup. And what, but what, what's fascinating about Phoenix, and maybe we'll get to this a little bit later in the show. What's fascinating about Phoenix too, though, is aside from uh, DeAndre Ayton, they don't have a lot of bigs. It's not like they are not a big team once you get past him, which yeah, is actually JaVale one of McGee. The, that's true. At least they do have a backup center this year. They didn't really last year. Well, um, once Sarge got hurt and uh, right. Frank the Tank wasn't enough, um, you, right. you could I see don't them really compromise. consider him to be a traditional right. But I mean, you know, but they brought in Javale McGee specifically for that. I mean, he is a very credible backup center. No, he, I mean, absolutely. I, how much he'll play, we'll see, and all that. But you know, you you look at it and. You know, I mean, he, he played in the preseason game for what it's no, worth. I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not saying he's not going to play. He's going to be chained to the bench. Or he won like a that. damn ring with the Lakers, Brian. <laughs> What's your problem? I we love Javale. I remember. He, I wish they brought him back. I mean, I, I'd rather. Ha- I would have much rather had Javale McGee than DeAndre Jordan. I'm just saying, man. Choices. Like, why, why are you dumping on Javale McGee? I am not. Andy, sure feels um, like not all of us grew up watching Mike and so, mm. you know, I mean, that's how I, basketball was meant to be played <laughs> shorts and belts <laughs> with, with pasty looking white dudes <laughs> wearing glasses, <laughs> like not literal like, glasses, not like athletic specs either. Just like the, the, there, there are only two kinds of glasses at the time. <laughs> I can tell you something, man, you are a brave guy to wear glasses in that era. Like that is, that is really every single game. You are risking going blind. Yeah. Cause they were Eric made out Elmo. of glass. Like, yes. you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, seriously, like George, Mike, we, we don't know the NBA's all time 75. You know, the list has not been officially gone out there. I know they've been trickling it out. I haven't really been paying attention. George, Mike, and should always be on there just for the risks that he took with his eyesight. eyesight like, he's the yeah. bravest man ever to play in the NBA. It's, period. And so, yeah, it, like, but you, you go through all this stuff and, you know, th- if, if, if the Lakers there, even if, if, if AD played five, almost exclusively in his minutes, it's hard to, I mean, e- at, at my most optimistic about how this, I it, really, at no point did I think there would be a, a rotation where the Lakers don't play a traditional center for 15 or 20 minutes a night between those guys, you know, give or take, 
Last night it was about 25, and that's in part because Trevor Rees is out. Um, you know, you can Cam only Horton do Tucker. so much as we learn defensively with Carmelo Anthony. Um, and so, you know, your his hands are a little bit tied with optionality. So, we you know if it stays. I mean, I, do you think ultimately? Once Ariza's back or they sign another body or they figure, you know, other guys that can bump other players down a little bit. So LeBron maybe can play a little more power forward and all that kind of stuff. Once that stuff happens, I mean, I think ultimately we're still looking at 20 ish minutes, 15 to 20 minutes a night of traditional center. And if it's 20 or 25 and AD is playing 55 percent of his time there instead of. 65% of his time there, as long as once the playoffs roll around, those ratios start to stretch out a little bit. I'm not, I don't want to get so wrapped up in this and so pedantic, you know, sort of pedantic about it that every percentage point becomes like this, uh, you know, endless argument on, you know, Twitter and the Locked on Lakers podcast. I mean, I think some of this is going to have to do with how does it look along the way? Because, I mean, the, the reality is DeAndre Jordan in game one was neither the problem nor the solution. He was fine. He was, he was fine. He was fine. He was not great. He was not terrible. I don't think he brought a ton to the table. I don't think he took away a lot from the table. Right. He was especially relative. To other, like defensively, there were some problems with him out there, but it's not like they went away when you took right. Jordan off the floor. Right, exactly. And and ultimately, that starting five, I thought, looked you know, somewhere between fine and good on balance for most of the game. And, and they, they certainly did not look bad. They were, and we're going to get into this. There were far more issues with the second unit than there were with the starters. So depending on how this evolves, before you even get Trevor Ariza, or I guess even to a lesser extent, Talon Horton Tucker back, where you could start making those type of decisions about really pretty dramatically shifting the lineup. If it works for a couple months, Frank Vogel may decide, and you know, justifiably, I'm not going to change this if it's actually working okay. Or if like on balance, I think this rotation over the course of 48 minutes, not just who starts, Mm -hmm. works pretty well. He may not feel the impetus to change, and it, and it may be justified. One of the things that could influence that in terms of the second unit, we were both, I think Frank Vogel was surprised, to uh, crack the glass on the break in case of emergency thing covering Avery Bradley. Um, that actually could influence a little bit of how, you know, sort of how these things go. It certainly will have an influence on the Russell Westbrook conversation. We will talk about both Avery and Russ next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends, family, they come together to connect. It's a place where classmates can meet up for a study group, knowing they'll have dependable Wi-Fi, endless supplies of French fries and McFlurries. Man, I would have loved high school study groups with Wi-Fi back in the day at a McDonald's. That would have been Awesome. Win or lose, it's a place where teammates, competitors, home team, the away team get together to recharge. You can always look forward to stopping on a long road trip to rest your legs, refuel. There was nothing better, Brian, growing up than after Little League, Nini, our grandmother, beloved Mm -hmm. grandmother, wonderful woman, always took us to McDonald's after every Little League game. I take my kids there. I mean, I would say 80. 5% 5% of the soccer games, when they're done, they're hungry. They want to go get McDonald's. Oh, it's it's the best, man. Yeah. Just, just walking in and the smell of the fries. There you go. That's enough. So head to your local McDonald's, refuel, reconnect. Did someone say Locked on Lakers watch party? I'm loving it. So Russell Westbrook struggled mightily in, in his first game as a Laker. Got a really interesting comment after the game from a, a listener that we'll get to here in just a second. But the, the other surprising thing that came out of Tuesday's game was the presence of Avery Bradley on the floor for the final eight minutes of the game. I'm not joking. When, when Avery Bradley checked in, I was like, who the hell is number 20? Like, it took me a second to like connect. Like, oh, shit, Avery Bradley's on this team. Like, I... Yeah. I had completely you forgot. forgot he'd only been there an hour. Well, you had said before, like they they took off the you know in case of emergency break glass uh, ornament around him. I don't even think they bothered putting that over him because I don't think there was any expectation. Oh, we might play Avery Bradley. Vogel said before the game he was available, did not expect him to play again. He'd been on the team for an hour, um, and you know it was a statement really about how bad the perimeter defense was, and. 
you know, the, this is something that, you know, the, the, the common assumption was that Bradley was, is not somebody who's necessarily going to be on a team all year. That once guys get back, um, the Lakers, to say the least, have a very crowded backcourt and that he would probably be cut. It's a non-guaranteed contract. Uh, he's here, do the best you can and see what happens. Um, that isn't, ne- that, hopefully that is true. And I don't mean that in a way like, let's get rid of Avery Bradley. If that scenario plays out, it means the Lakers have stabilized their backcourt defense. If Bradley is still on the team in March, it probably means either somebody else got hurt, which would suck, or that the Lakers haven't really stabilized that backcourt defense and that they need him in ways that they they may not have figured out a way to replicate. And both of those latter two scenarios are suboptimal. Well, and they're both live scenarios. I mean, yes. just looking at the roster, we said even the most optimistic, and you and I have both projected the Lakers going at minimum to the finals, um, defense was going to be a question mark for this team to solve. Avery Bradley, other than Kent Bazemore, is the only established point of, of attack defender this team has among the guards, if nothing else. And he may mm-hmm. be their best one, even as a guy who's been cut and waved and traded a lot over the last few years. That is something he does extremely well. It's something the championship team used to talk about as a tone setter. Like I remember the first time that season, because he had a few injuries, but he got injured pretty early in the season. They openly talked about the challenge of replicating Avery Bradley's energy. So if you're looking for defensive integrity, particularly in the second unit, that might be a place to go because yeah. there's there are a lot of options for guys who can't guard among yeah. the guards who would play in the second unit. Yeah. I mean, look, Monk struggled. And, you know, uh, you know, he 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 struggled. We'll see how Kendrick Nunn, hopefully available for Friday and into the weekend, does. Um, you know, obviously THT when he comes back. Like there's a lot of stuff they can do to change it. You you are you are setting yourself up for trouble with with Westbrook, Rondo, and and Mello <laughs> together on the floor. That is and not Monk. something. They were doing that. <laughs> they had all four of them on one? Oh, geez. I believe so. I believe it probably I, happened. You're right. Three I mean, of the four. Like, you know, so but it's it's a good reminder when if you're a Laker fan worried about the defense, that is not a lineup that is supposed to happen. Right. Um, and and you know, much of what we saw on Tuesday, if guys get healthy, will not happen as the season goes on. Um, but you know, Bradley is a is an interesting kind of uh test case and kind of, you know, uh you know, in terms of how the defense is going, the more he plays, it probably means Vogel is getting more frustrated with with um with what he's seeing so speaking of frustration andy russell westbrook looked awful in his opening night with the lakers um if you missed it he was four of 13 from the floor he missed all four of his threes he had four assists and four turnovers he was a minus 23 in 35 minutes that number actually went down at the end of the game when the lakers hit six uh two three-pointers that were completely meaningless. So the, those ratios were actually far worse while the game was going on. Um, and, you know, we do this thing with the Locked On Network or the hosts get together. We talk about stuff, you know, throw ideas around in the, the weekly water cooler. And you were there today and guys were kind of asking like, okay, how on a scale of one to 10, how is Lakers Nation panicking over Westbrook's um, performance? <laughs> and my response was, it's hard to know just because there's been a lot of dread and pessimism and nervousness since the moment they brought him in. <laughs> right. Just because even, even if you are somebody who believes in the potential upside of having Westbrook on this team, you still have to acknowledge there is a lot to figure out with Russell Westbrook. Like As talented as he is, he is a really complicated player to right. fit into your team. Can compare you know? it, Andy, compare it to like when they traded for AD. It's like, right. yeah, this LeBron and AD. Okay. Do we know it's good? Like, no, it's going to work. No, but it's going to work. Like there's, there's nothing in that combination where you or like go, when the Lakers traded sure. for pow, you look at Kobe and pow together. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes complete sense. It was obvious why it was going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, I actually thought, 
you know, we were obviously on on Twitter at the very least. I don't know what's happening on the Reddit, the deepest parts of the Reddit <laughs> chat boards, um, you know, or some of these, you know. Let us know, by the way, either um, in the YouTube comments or on Twitter, whatever. Like if, if you are trolling through the deepest recesses of the Reddit community and you happen to run into, I guess, the Locked On Lakers community or whatever. Just let La- us know La- what's, what's happening. Going, well, what's, going, what's going on in Lakers conspiracy theory? Yeah, keep, um, uh, <laughs> keep an ear to those streets because we don't want to go there, but we I do want to like, know what's we, being we, said. Locked On Lakers podcast is on uh, YouTube. You know, we, we, you know, we're yeah. very fortunate. We appreciate people comment. I thought the comments were pretty, you know, chillaxed. Overall, I think people understood it's <laughs> I think those one. people were too drunk to panic. It does, though, lead to, to, to a question. Like, wh- where is that line between... All right, everybody knows it's going to take a little time. Westbrook, even in moments where it's not going to fit, is still going to play better than he did on Tuesday. Um, but like, wait, wait, how how long for you personally will it take for you to go like, okay, I'm actually a little concerned that it's not going to work as in the way it needs to. Like, I mean. You know what? I, I mean, you say the devil in the details and the context and all of that's true, but it becomes even more magnified because I need to know how long it's going to take before they have an actual rotation that they right. want to be playing. All that being said, I would realistically give it at least a couple months. You're, before, you're looking at Christmas, really. Yeah, at least. And that's fair. I, I, I say that just because you know, there's history when it comes to LeBron and Dwayne Wade and those guys looking to figure it out. There's again, just the, the bare facts that Russell Westbrook is a complicated, he's, you know, we were talking about this before, Brian, he is maybe the least subtle player in NBA history. Yes, um, so th- there's, there's a lot to figure out with this. I think the type of patience that really is required is a couple months at least. So, yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's reasonable. I think most Lakers fans are on board with that. Like, they're gonna, they need to win games in between now and then, and they will just because you know sheer force of talent. They're going to, they'll, they'll be fine in that regard. Um, I did, we did get though this um, comment from uh, a, a listener, Harish Red at Harish Red on Twitter, and he had this comment because I made a joke on Tuesday waiting for Austin Reeves to check himself into the game as you know, things were kind of going downhill. Like Reeves rips off his, his sweats, just, t- he just checks himself into the game. Kobe style, yeah. um, you know, and, and, and you know, making it obviously a joke. We got this, uh, from Harish who said, I don't mind the loss so much as the fact that Vogel or LA, the, the LA think tank didn't choose to take Russ out down the stretch. It would have made a statement that the team is built around Braun and AD and takes the pressure off Russ. I want to think about that statement because I think it's a really interesting one um, that I don't agree with in any way practically or from a basketball standpoint, but it still leads to kind of some interesting conversation. We'll do that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Calm. Do you want to know what makes LeBron James, King James, yes. sleep? Oh, that's right. Sleep. That's his superpower. Calm. The number one app for sleep and meditation has teamed up with LeBron James. Yes, that LeBron James to help you activate. (laughs) Of the the Akron LeBron Jameses? Yes, of the Akron LeBron Jameses. LeBron and Calm know that your mind is like any other muscle in your body, but you don't have to be a world champion to learn how to train it. Calm can help you train your brain so you sleep better, reduce your sleep, and perform at your best just like LeBron James, although probably not literally <laughs> like LeBron James. If you are, say, sub six feet and not a good athlete, I don't care how much meditating you yeah, do. There's, I cannot sleep my way to that type of performance. <laughs> but, but you will, though, be the best version of yourself, and that's what matters most. So head to calm.com slash locked on NBA for a limited time. You get 40% off a Calm premium subscription, you have the access to the nature scenes LeBron loves, like rain on leaves. That's actually really interesting. I like that. So much more, like sleep stories, meditation, so you can be ready for any challenge life throws your way. You can start keeping the main thing the main thing, as LeBron would say. So again, limited time. Our listeners can join LeBron in using Calm. Get a 40% discount on a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash locked on NBA. Unlock content to help you focus, ease stress, sleep better. Get started at calm.com slash locked on NBA. That's calm.com locked on NBA. 
That's a don't do it. That's a, that's, that's a doozy. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a tough pun right there. I'll tell you what, nobody likes to talk about excessive sweating. The type of sweating you do when you have to say things like calm.com. Uh, really any kind of sweating, but definitely not the excessive kind. Sweating through shirts for no reason, ruining clothes. Really needed to be calm, not <laughs> Having the anxiety that comes Calm down to work. We've mo- we're moving on. <laughs> it's a shame there actually is no C A L M like suffix for the mm-hmm. for the internet because I think it could just be calm dot com mm-hmm. and that would be easy. Um, but anyway, if you're not an excessive sweater, I'm not an excessive sweater. But we all have those moments of high pressure, whether <laughs> job interview, first date tough reads <laughs> nerves get going and all of a sudden you find yourself sweating in ways you typically don't uh and for any of those situations whether it's a chronic thing uh something more specific need to use sweat block antiperspirant wipes these things are doctor created they're doctor recommended they work for up to seven days per use and they come with a dry shirt guarantee if sweat block doesn't keep you dry you get your money back uh, they've been featured and tested on the rachel ray show by firefighters uh and it's it's the best seller on amazon for the past 10 years Thirteen thousand reviews currently number one on the Amazon antiperspirant category category. Uh, it's manufactured in the USA. So go uh, to sweatblock.com and get 20% off by using the promo code locked on. You do that again at sweatblock.com with the promo code locked on, or you get it at Amazon and CVS. Um, all right. So I'll read it again. Our, our friend Harish said, I don't mind the loss so much as the fact that Vogel And the L.A. think tank overall didn't choose to take Russ out down the stretch. It would have made a statement that the team is built around Braun and A.D. and takes the pressure off of Russ. I disagree with everything in that in that tweet. Um, If you take him, if you don't, if you pull him in the first game he plays as a Laker in crunch time, you're creating massive headlines and you're not decreasing uh, the pressure off of him. It does. It makes a statement that, oh my God, we're freaking the bleep out around here in the first game of the season. Would you agree? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get into. I've, I've got. If people need an example of this uh, in Laker history, I will share it. But continue. Right. So I, I don't agree with the premise of it, but what I do think is interesting about it is this idea of what is the best way to make Russ comfortable because ad after the game lebron after the game vogel after every russ has got to be russ and you can tell on tuesday at least he was trying to be the most responsible version of russ the right kind of the one that's not going to screw up this title team because he doesn't fit in and you know there was the, the comfort level wasn't there so while I disagree with Harish, and he's you know, westbrook is going to be part of every closing lineup the lakers play with maybe rare exception unless he's hurt what do what is the best way to take pressure off of Westbrook and make him comfortable? I think that's the core of what he's getting at here. Well, I, I think to some degree it's get over the jitters of your childhood fantasies of becoming a Laker now being true. I mean, mm-hmm. the, you know, this was this was described as much as I do think Russ is really trying to make the best possible impression. We've compared this a lot to you know, beginning a relationship, you know, like you're really behaving in front of your significant other's parents, that sort of right. thing. I think a lot of this was, holy shit, I'm a Laker. Like I am, and yeah, LeBron, I described this, Le- LeBron described this as first game jitters. Anthony Davis alluded to that. Like, I think some of this was specific to, it's not just my new team I'm trying to make the impression with. It's, I'm a Laker. Like this is surreal for Russell Westbrook in ways that, You know, as much as LeBron and Anthony Davis were excited about joining this team, it's not the same thing. And I I think there there's gonna be some newness to just this being the reality that has to go away before you you start seeing the full comfort with Westbrook, like beyond whatever you scheme on the court, beyond whatever you have these responsibilities, that sort of thing. I think he just has to sort of get over the fact that he's a Laker. Yeah. And I I I, it is ultimately time and reps and i don't think you i I just don't i don't think you can take the pressure off of him i i I think that is something that is not going to be able to be done because he is the thing we know anthony davis and lebron james as a combination works we know you could have added buddy healed to that as a traditional floor spacing shooting guard and it would have worked is the is the top side is the ceiling as high i don't know but like on paper, <laughs> right? On I mean, paper, I, 
to full disclosure, I was not wild about the Buddy Heald uh, trade rumors. But on or, but like on paper, when you're it's designing, simpler. There's right, no question. It's simpler. It's simpler. It, it matches the traditional how you win yes. around LeBron yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the template is there. There is no template for let's add Russell Westbrook to LeBron James and, and Anthony Davis, um, figuratively or literally. And so, you know, it would have been simpler that way. And I think it's it's a much easier thing. But like, and, and he is aware of that. But I, and I, because of it, though, I just don't I don't think there's a way to remove that pressure. Because it's either going to work or not work, and the the presence of Westbrook is going to be blamed for a lot of it if it doesn't. Even if Russ kind of plays the way, exactly the way you would expect him to, in yeah. a good way. Yeah, I mean this this is inherent with being a superstar joining the Lakers, you know, for a championship run. That's what the hopes are. I mean, this is just the deal. And and look, Russ has been under scrutiny his entire career, like ever since he really came to prominence in ways that I think a lot of people didn't, he was drafted fourth overall, but I don't think the prognostications were this for his career. I mean, if oh, memory sure, serves, hall of famer, triple doubles, no, if memory the serves, year, there were a lot yeah. of people kind of questioning, Oh wow. Four is kind of high. That, that's didn't see that coming. Um, so he's been under this a lot. You know, he's been seen as the reason that it didn't work out in OKC, that Kevin Durant wanted to get away from him. He's been seen as a guy that keeps getting shuffled around to different teams and it never works. So the idea that he's under a microscope, you know, I think it may bother him. And, you know, I mean, he, he just did an entire documentary, you know, basically with the idea of I'm putting out my story because the media keeps putting out horseshit narratives about me. So he doesn't like it. But the idea that he's not used to it, no. Um, and as far, just really quick before we get to a couple teams we want to discuss, in terms of why you don't bench Russell Westbrook, I think in general, but particularly in game one where you are laying a foundation, if I may take you back in time, Brian, 2012, third game together, Mike D'Antoni, Pau Gasol. Mm. If you may recall, in this game against the Grizzlies, Mike D'Antoni did not play Pau for the entire fourth quarter and what he when he was asked about his thought process with that he responded with quote i was thinking oh i'd like to win this game that's what i was thinking and uh we covered those teams for espn brian we witnessed the dynamic up close i think I didn't like agree. that answer <laughs> uh the two didn't of them well. never recovered that relationship went to hell and t- to be clear you know mike d'antoni while we both liked him covering him, that guy, other than Phil Jackson, who simply didn't have to do politics because he's Phil, Mike D'Antoni may be the least diplomatic coach I've ever encountered. Yep. Like he has no filter whatsoever. So Frank, he alienated Powell from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And as much as Powell occasionally did passive aggressive stuff to exacerbate it, the reason this fell apart from the outset was 100% D'Antoni's fault. And Frank Vogel, I guarantee, would never handle it as tactlessly, but it's but it doesn't matter. It create it, 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 you create a storyline. It, you, it you... creates something that it, I mean, this was something that remained not just between Pow and D'Antoni as individuals, but as a storyline for like the next right. season that he played under D'Antoni. And it's by the way, and it's not even a thing where you say, "Oh, it's just the media." Like, no, benching Russell Westbrook in the first game of the season, benching him really ever in a lot of these down the stretch. Um, you know, crunch time minutes is a deal. It is a thing. You, 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 know, you don't that, want to That's start. not the media making something no. up. That is, you, whoa. You don't start the relationship really, in the right. regular you season. You really don't start with it, but you, you, you kind of aren't. This Russell Westbrook is going to be part of the late game rotation in every game the Lakers play unless he's hurt. Yeah. This, is, this is how it is going to be, and it's either going to work or it's not going to work. But it's not going to be adjusted by bringing Westbrook off the bench and letting him run with the second unit or or, or all these things. And I get to run. He's going to be fine. Um, and I'm not saying they're going to win title, but, but he's going to be fine. Um, all right, let's let's talk a little bit about the the weekend. We we mentioned a few times the Lakers overall have a, a very home heavy, relatively easy schedule. Their first three games are not. We saw you know Golden State can play a little bit. Um, they see Phoenix on Friday. They went to the finals last year. And I think Memphis on Sunday is one of the most intriguing young teams in the league. It's kind of interesting that they have, Andy, Phoenix, 
and Memphis, two teams that both of us are very interested in this weekend. Yeah, it's funny. You and I, when we were thinking about stuff to discuss, we were like, you know, maybe we should maybe take a look around the league and just each pick a team that we find interesting just to sort of talk about the Western Conference. And we just randomly, without even realizing the schedule, landed on Phoenix and Memphis. Phoenix, I just think, is really fascinating because it's how do you build on what happened last year? How much does collective experience matter? Like how much can those individual players grow? I think Phoenix is an exceptionally well-constructed team. Mm -hmm. I think they may have the highest natural collective floor of any of the Western Conference teams. Like it doesn't take much for them to maintain a pretty high floor. Like just do what you're supposed to do. And you maintain that floor, and floor really matters. But the idea of, okay, how much can they raise their ceiling, I think is a really fascinating discussion because they're a team that a lot of people have questioned how much was their finals run the benefit of luck. And there was definitely Mm -hmm. luck involved. There always is. But what's the ratio? And, you know, like how much can Devin Booker become a true? two-way player, like how much more can Cam Johnson, Mikhail Bridges grow? Like how much can Chris Paul evolve as a leader with this team where he doesn't always have to be the Yoda? Does DeAndre Ayton stay focused on the right stuff after doing everything he was supposed to do last season Mm -hmm. and more and not getting that extension? He saw Landry freaking Shamit get an extension from Phoenix. Like different money, but like- Damn it, Shamit. Yeah, he he ain't DeAndre Ayton. So like at the same time though, I think they are- one of the best constructed teams in the league. They can score from everywhere. Like they're defensively sound. They they don't really have any weaknesses like that you look at and go, ooh, that that's a thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I would agree. How much can they grow, I think, is a really, really fascinating question. And I look and the reason I think Memphis is so interesting too is that they are poised, if there is a team in the West that I think can make an unexpected jump. Maybe you can look at Minnesota. You know, they, they've got some good young players. I thought they, about them actually, um, but overall, you know, they're further away, at least mm-hmm. based on on previous performance. Um, you know, Sacramento's not going to make it. I don't think they're going to be a tire fire, but I just don't think they're going to be very good. No, I'm voting tire fire. Yeah, they could be um, tough. Tough. For Once our a tire here. fire, always a tire fire, baby. Yeah, and you know, but then Denver, we kind of know what they are. Utah, we know what they are. Portland, like, there's a lot of teams we have a pretty decent idea of what they are. San Antonio, we don't know. I think they could be a play-in team, but like they're not going to jump. What I think is interesting about Memphis, though, is they are best poised to do something like Phoenix did with you know, a, a, an ascending player in John Morant if he can get a little bit more consistent from the outside. If Jaron Jackson Jr. can stay healthy, improve his defense and his rebounding just a little bit, make that he crushed people in the preseason. I love like, him. Th- there's, there's a lot of room for natural improvement just with their star players, they've got a lot of really good young players around them. Deon, uh, DeAnthony Melton is is a good player. You know, Bain they found with the 30, 30th pick last year. He's a good player. Um, you know, just up and down the roster is like sneaky good depth that they can put 10 guys or 11 guys. They're not going to win a title. Uh, I don't think they, you know, if they won a round in this, in the playoffs this year, I think I'd actually be surprised. But can you make that kind of leap? Like what kind of leap can you make based on internal players that I really like without adding the Chris Paul part? Yeah. You know, like that's yeah. like, they're, they're not going to make a Phoenix like leap because a, they're not as good and B they didn't add that elements, but they are my vote for the team that has the most potential to make something of a leap that goes beyond what people are expecting. And beyond that, I just, I'm, I think they're well run. I think they are, uh, well coached with uh, Taylor Jenkins, and um, I just I just like what they're doing over there. They've got a little bit of that sort of they play defense really well. Uh, they they have a you know sort of that grit and grind ethos still there that, that that's still in the building, but with a little more excitement with the players that they have. And I'm just I'm excited to watch Friday's game and excited to watch Sunday's game. I, I love John, the two man. two good Western Conference teams to compare the Lakers to at this point in the season. I'm excited to see it. I love Ja, man. That guy is oh. so much fun to watch play. Yeah, he's great. He's just into the joy, and I'm like Jackson is back and all that. So he's got a giraffe. Two, he does named after him. So two uh, great games come this weekend. We got a great show for you on uh, Friday with Sirit Soe from 
the ringer. Um, she is just one of the, the best voices out there right now. One of the most unique voices out there in the NBA. So we're excited to have her on the show. We'll talk uh, about where the Lakers, she thinks the Lakers will go this year. A little Ben Simmons probably and some other stuff, a little succession talk yeah. I think, as we get into the second week of the new season. So uh, plenty to cover and look forward to this weekend. We'll see everybody tomorrow.